Hello. Thank you so much for having me. So CSS is really, really powerful tool. You can use it for art now. You can use it to do pixel manipulation. Here is an example of a code pen where I'm generating these random bokeh dots with the help of SAS random function. Every time you refresh, you get a sort of different aesthetic, which is nice, generative art. You can do things like this, where you're just playing with images, applying different filters and blend modes, kind of like Lomography, just seeing how creative you can get. It's a really nice outlet. You can even create um, infrared effects, so faking this infrared camera effect. You don't need special equipment or tools or even going out into the field and taking photos when you can use CSS to recreate these effects. And you can create 3D images. 3D images where you're applying different blend modes, putting them on top of each other, seeing how they interact, and creating these effects, sort of mimicking how the eye can look at an image. Now that there's in the browser, you can really interact with them. You can apply animation to them. You can make 3D animated videos if you wanted in the browser. It's all possible. And it's really cool. And if you want to see any more information about these demos I mentioned, you can check out arttheweb.com, which has posts that sort of detail more of how to do those things. But then I get this uh, when I give this talk. And this woman is saying, do you make money from your art? And the boy says, yes. And she says, really? So I want to show you how blend modes are not just a little art piece that you can show off. They can be implemented in your UIs and be a really nice way to add a good touch to your projects and websites. So my name is Yuna. Um, you can find me on the internet at Yuna. That's pretty much everywhere, GitHub, Twitter. I'm a UI engineer at DigitalOcean. It's a server company based in New York. Um, I started a couple of SAS meetups. That's how I got involved in the scene. Started the Austin SAS meetup, and I started the one in Washington, D.C., back in the States. And I also co-host a podcast called Tools Day, where it's about 20 to 30 minutes of tech tool talk a week on Tuesdays, roughly at 2 p.m. EST. So let's start with filters. Um, filters are really great and super, super powerful. So with filters, we have blur, brightness, contrast, drop shadow, grayscale, hue rotate, invert, opacity, sepia, and saturate. And you can also combine any of these in a space separated list in your CSS to get multiple effects. So a nice graphic of all of them up here. You can see that they take different values. A lot of them are 0 to 1 inclusive, like grayscale. Um, brightness, you can go higher than 1, as well as contrast. Things like blur need an absolute value. So an absolute pixel value, you can use M's. Don't use M's. It'll break your browser if you do anything higher than like 10 pixels. It's really bad. Um, you can use an argument list and drop shadow. So if you're familiar with argument lists, um, that's, that's what that looks like. So just in one line of code, you can really transform your page. The browser support is pretty good. And the other thing is, since they're just visual effects, a lot of the time they're a nice bonus. So with progressive enhancement, you can just add them on top. Here's an example of just using it really quickly, one line in a website. So I, I wrote this. This is just an image from my blog. Um, drew these little sketches inside of an app called Paper. And Paper inherently has a gray background. But instead of opening all of these images individually in Photoshop, editing them, putting them back into my blog, I just added one line of code. Um, I don't know if you can really see it up there, but there is a difference between that background color and that foreground color. I just used a lighten filter. Lighten 1.1 and bam. If you're using something auto prefixer, you don't even have to prefix the WebKit, but if you're not, these do have a WebKit prefix to them. Another example of something that you can do is this a really common pattern that we see for focusing attention on an area. So, a sidebar here, this is the Dolce & Gabbana website. Um, and what they do is when you click that sidebar open, a div pops up with this semi transparent black background that lays over the page, and it focuses your attention on that sidebar. But we can recreate this with blend modes. We don't need to have the additional diff. We don't even need to have a background color. There is a property, hopefully, will get implemented called backdrop filter. Um, and backdrop filter is really cool because not only can we create this effect that sort of has that darker color in the background, but we can add blurs. Um, since it's a filter, we can use any of those 10 filters. So remember, hue rotate is one of the options. Um, we can do, you know, we can change the brightness value, any of that. Um, and get that same effect, but it's so interactive, and we can do it just directly in the browser. We can prototype right here. 
So if I want to add a brightness, that means I can also make it darker if that brightness value is less than 1. So we don't even need that line of code with the background. Don't need a background at all. In one line of CSS with backdrop filter, we can recreate this entire effect. It's pretty cool. The browser support is pretty bad. <laughs> Um, womp womp. However, there are workarounds. There are hacks that let you do this. Uh, here is another example of this. It allows that text to be much more legible inside that modal window. So it has a light background, but it's also blurring that mountain image behind that text. So how do we recreate this in our current modern browsers? How can we do this? It's called um, the fixed background hack, and it looks like this. What you're essentially doing is applying the same background to the page and the element that you want to fake that blur effect. Um, so I have here this fixed background, um, and I have zero cover, so it takes up the entire page. So whatever I'm revealing of that background as I scroll will reveal the same spot as the background of the page. So since that's an element that we've added on top of that background, we can apply filters. We can apply blur, we can apply a brightness filter to make that text more legible. And it creates sort of that same effect, that same idea. You can add draggable to it, like that previous example in CodePen. And there we go. You can do things like revealing images. So I can hover over this and get whatever's behind it. Um, you can do this with text, so making text more legible on top of images if you had links or information about speakers or users. And it's really easy to do this just in a couple of lines of code. You can apply this filter. This is you know, using auto prefix here, so it's going to add that WebKit prefix. Um, and then add some content afterwards, just in two divs, have a wrapper and a div within it. And you have created this effect, which is a blur that reveals some text as you hover on top. So another cool thing about filters is not just is there a variety of options to play with and choose from, but you're saving image requests with your hover states, with whatever active states focus you want. Um, because you don't have to have an image for your main view and a separate image that you're downloading onto your user's site for that secondary view. You can just apply a filter to it. And that's saving you a lot of memory if you're not sending multiple images of the same thing to your users. So filters can be really, really useful in that sense. And here's just a good example of the variety that you can apply and mixing some of them. So filters are really cool, but really what I think is awesome about the web today is blend modes, blend modes, how divs and colors can interact on the web. And this is really, really powerful. There's a lot more variety than the filters. So here we have all these options, and they come in a couple of groups. Uh, darken, Multiply, and Color Burn will all make those images darker. There's the Lighten group, which is Lighten, Screen, and Color Dodge. There's overlay soft light and hard light. Then there's two that are kind of similar, which is difference and exclusion. And the last four are all color properties, so hue, saturation, color, and luminosity. Um, browser support is decent on these, so keep that in mind. There are two different ways to apply them. There is background blend mode, which applies these to an element that has multiple backgrounds. So if I have an element with a couple of different photo backgrounds or a photo background and a color on it, then I can apply a background blend mode to it, and it mixes it within that element itself. If I use a mixed blend mode, which has very similar support, it's pretty identical, um, you're basically saying that you want to mix that element with the page around it. So here's an example of using multiply. On the right, we don't have it applied. And on the left over here, we do have it applied. And it's creating this really intense depth of color, because what it's doing is it's taking each pixel value, the luminosity, so that brightness value, and it's multiplying it. It's like a transparency. Um, if you shine a light through two transparencies, the dark values will remain, while the light values will shine right through, and any intermediate values will mix. And that's exactly what's happening here. So you can really see the depth of these gradients that are occurring in the CSS background. Multiply can be used throughout your site to really unify it and bring an overall aesthetic to it. I like giving this example of this bright yellow. It makes the white text somewhat legible on this page. Who would have known um, using yellow and white could work? And it's a theme that continues throughout the site without detracting from it. They're using black and white images and this pop of color by multiplying it. 
Um, what's really cool about CSS specifically is since it is in the browser, it is live, you can interact with it. So your users can get the sense of delight as they scroll through and the page is changing. And you can do this in just a couple of lines of code. Um, it's an effect that I think is pretty cool and unique to the web today. CSSConf did a really good job of this. So on their website, this is the CSSConf that's happening in Boston this year. They have these SVG blobs, these gradient SVG blobs that sort of move with the page as you scroll and also wiggle around the page. So you can see that they're slowly changing shape on this page, and they're not really interfering with the content they're adding to it. They're bringing a little bit of color to that. Um, later down the page, they're overlapping images. You can also apply any of these effects to images, um, videos, I mean. So you can apply them on things that are moving, interactive. Um, and I'll give an example of that in a moment. So with this, we can also create designs like this and make them possible in the browser. And when you make a design like this, which I found on Dribbble, possible in the browser, you can make that accessible to screen readers. You can make it searchable with um, search engines like Google. And your content is being repeated on the page. This becomes content, not just a JPEG that you had to save out or a PNG, which is pretty cool. We need to stop getting our inspiration for websites from other websites. And this is something that I understand happens for a reason. People are really focused on flat design, which is great for performance. But now there are so many more options with the web and how CSS and HTML and JavaScript are transforming that we can do better. We can get inspiration from fashion or architecture or illustration. There's more out there than just other websites to take a look at. I would love to see this trend of people experimenting more online. Another example that I found on Dribbble that's a similar aesthetic is this one. So again, you can recreate this in SVGs and text instead of having to create a separate PNG or JPEG that you're serving to your users. Um, here is an example of the next blend mode I want to talk about, which is the screen blend mode. And screen is the total opposite of multiply, which is why I like this example, because it shows both. So if in multiply we are multiplying the luminosity values of the pixels, in screen we are taking the inverse and multiplying the inverse. Uh, the way that you get the inverse of a pixel value is you subtract it from 1. So instead of A times B, A being the active layer, B being the background layer, we are taking the inverse of the active layer's luminosity value, multiplying that by the inverse of the background layer's luminosity value, and then inverting all of that, because we're subtracting both of that from 1. And that's how you're getting this effect. You're, you're basically lightening up all the parts that you would be darkening in multiply. An example I want to show you of how to really use this and make it interactive in your sites is with this portrait. So here's a portrait of a woman. And um, say I wanted to apply an interactive texture to it, right? So here I have a video file. Because this is code, I can just go here and hit screen. And you have this instant video effect created on your site. Again, because this is code, I could just add some filters. I could add a blur filter and make this dynamic. You can have this be interactive with your users. And um, to show that, this is just what it looks like. So something that is super, super um, flexible that you can play with on the web. Also, I wanted to see what this looked like in a GIF format. So I recreated this exact same thing in a GIF. As you can see, it's kind of janky. Um, you lose a lot of the colors there. And also, the file format size is incredibly large. So let's compare them. We have the blend mode over here. I know 3.6 megabytes sounds large. It's a huge image that I used for this presentation and an MOV file that's pretty long. Definitely can use better video formats and smaller images, but just as an example. So even though that's really big, when I converted it to a GIF, it was 24.7 megabytes. Nobody wants to serve that. Nobody wants to pull that from the web. So there are a few ways that you can use this to your benefit and make it much more performant on your site. This was a really clever example of screen that I wanted to share that I found online by Jan Druniak. So he's creating this menu where if you hover over it, you can see what those icons are individually. But together, it's just this really cute little circle that sits on your page. You can also create text masks with mixed blend mode. Um, you can use the lighten and darken blend modes or multiply and screen. I wouldn't recommend this because background, um, sorry, text clip is a little bit more well supported and performant than this, but it is an option. It's something that people can play with and see online. I really like this example. This is a sort of profile view. 
um, Emma Watson, and she has this sort of gray to blue gradient applied on top of her, if you could see that. And this is lightened, and you can tell that it's lightened because in the dark areas, we lose a lot of the detail. Um, and it kind of just makes it a little bit more murky. I really like this effect. I think it's a very unifying effect. So the way that, that works is, if we want to take this color, like this pink color, and lighten it by this blue shade, we get this nice purple. And it just does it for us in the browser. So you can look at it pretty simply. If you remember that um, black is RGB 000, and white is 255, 255, 255, right? So when we're lightening it, we're looking at each of these RGB values and comparing them. Which one's lighter, 190 or 40? It's 190. Um, what about the green value? Which one's lighter, 25 or 160? 160, exactly, and then 240. And if you see what's happening here, that's how we get this purple value at the end. It's pretty cool. So with dark, and you're doing the opposite, where you're looking for that smaller value, closer to darker colors, like black, um, and that's doing the same thing, comparing those values. The next thing I want to talk about is sort of on the topic of this effect, because it is my favorite one. Um, so using lightning, you can create this sort of faded out, vintage effect that can really unify a page. And we're seeing this more commonly in design and on the web. So it looks like this, losing some of those detail in the shadow and applying sort of a wash over this image. And the way you do it, here I'm using the background blend mode property and two background images on that, that page. So I have a color applied and that background, which is just the image link. Um, basically, I want to do a mixed background of Lighten or the background blend mode of Lighten, and then choose the darkest color I want on that page. So if I want the darkest color to be that bright yellow, you can throw it all the way up there. It'll wash everything out that's darker than it. Um, if I want it to be like a nice navy gray or a purple, then this is perfect for that. So here's an example of that. It's a duotone effect, but you can see, again, in those shadows that you're losing some of that color. Uh, the Shopify ad campaign that came out for their uh, year in review, sort of end of year, uh, year in music. I thought it was really cool. Like, beautiful colors, really cool blend modes applied, and just mashed together in a really nice way. Okay, so the next one I want to talk about is the color blend mode. And color is really cool. Um, and here I'm going to use this dog to show you. I'm going to overlap and then apply color. So basically what color is doing is it is taking the hue value and the saturation value of the active layer, so the rainbow colors, and applying that to the luminosity, the dark and light values of that dog behind it. So that dog could be black and white and have that color applied to it, and you would never know. It wouldn't make a difference. Um, whatever color on top you want to apply, it's taking those two values. If you look at this sort of ring of color, you have luminosity, which again is your dark to light value. You have your hue, so that shade on the color wheel. And then you have how far away that color is from 50% gray, which is the saturation. And these are all their own individual blend modes. So you can apply just the luminosity of a color or an image or a gradient to an image behind it. Uh, it'll just take the lighting, the light and dark values. You can apply just the saturation of it. Or you can apply just the hue value of it which allows for a lot of different combination on the web. Here's an example of that color applied to an image behind it. Don't know if this image is colored. Don't know if it's black and white. Probably a smaller file size to send if you're sending a black and white image. Um, and it's just applied on this page, gives it a wash of color, makes that text a little bit more legible as well, um, and just gives it a nice overall effect. I spoke at a conference last month where they used this icon system where they use the same, like a similar color of pink for all the icons. It was a nice way to sort of blend and bring the page together. For the intro video here, they did the same thing. It's a nice unifying effect, because everyone's photos are going to have different shades in them. Um, and I was scrolling along the speaker page and looking at all the speakers, thinking about, OK, so what are the talks going to be? And I noticed that one of the speakers didn't have the color applied. It was just sort of missing. And I thought, well. If we had you know, CSS, this is a really easy cascading change to make just in case this ever happens. You don't even have to open any of those images in Photoshop and edit them manually. You can apply a single class to them and have them all get that effect throughout the entire page. So what we can do here is use color. Uh, use that color blend mode, create this pseudo element, this after pseudo element to sit on top of the image. Um, and because we're doing this in the browser, we can even open up DevTools and see which color we like the best. 
This is like prototyping in the browser instantly, as fast as you can do it, wherever you are presenting your site to your users. So then you have this uniform effect throughout your site. But you know, you got to be wary of browser differences, and maybe not all browsers support this sort of thing. And if you think about it, what we just did was we applied a block of color on top of this image of a person. So if the browser doesn't support blend modes, you're just going to see a block of color. We can mitigate this. This thing to embrace the cascade. Um, we can mitigate this by using one of those hue, saturation, and luminosity values. We can create the same pseudo element, this after pseudo element, put it behind the image, apply a luminosity blend mode of the image on top of the color, and so that is going to apply the lightness and darkness values of the image to the color behind it. So if the browser doesn't support blend modes, you'll still see the original image. So that's sort of how you take the inverse of color and you're applying it in this manner. You can still edit this with color throughout with your dev tools and see what shades you like and what you get and interact with it. It all works the same way. So if you have an idea in mind um, here, just recreating Instagram filters, you can really create anything. And the way that you can recreate any sort of filter effect is through gradients, because gradients allow you to create multiple blocks of color on a single plane. And that means you don't have to have multiple divs to create these elements. I really like this idea of recreating um, I just used Instagram as an example, but figuring out how those gradients can interact and work. So here I have a radial gradient. Some of the filters didn't even need a blend mode. Um, so here I have just a color, a solid color with a few different filters applied. So you can go through and really use that as a baseline to compare and create. So create this open source project called CSSgram, which has a variety of these filters applied. Um, they do have animatable properties somewhat to them. Um, and it's totally available open source if you want to contribute, if you want to grab this, it's available via CDN and apply it to your images. I've seen it in videos. I've seen it. There's a coffee shop that has like a little mini app within it that uses this, which is pretty cool. Um, but just experiment and explore. CSS Gram is not the only thing out there. There is now ViscoCam, uh, which is CSS Go, the CSS version of it. It uses the ViscoCam images and recreates those. And there's this one that I think is pretty cool and unique. Um, it's called Color Filter, which is the same idea, but they're kind of recreating that bright Spotify effect. And the URL is sort of long, so if you want to go back to this one, I would take a picture of it. But luckybj.github.io slash colorfilter. If you could write that down really fast. The next one I want to talk about is a mix of a few blend modes, and that is the overlay blend mode. So here you could see that applied to the text of that calculator. And overlay is interesting because it takes two. The screen blend mode and the multiply blend mode applies the screen blend mode to the light values at 50%. And the dark values get the multiply blend mode applied. Um, and it really makes this like nice, uh, sort of not dramatic effect. It looks like this closer up. The calculator, as it's darker on top, the numbers on it are darker, and lighter ones are lighter. So it creates like a little smooth effect. Um, a little bit better seen here in this border. So in the light values, it's, it's lightening that image by the same percentage as it is in the dark values. So instead of just like a white border around it, it makes a more unified visualization. All right, so the difference blend mode. Uh, the best way I like to explain this is with these little games. Do you remember these games from childhood? Can you spot the differences between uh, number one and number two? Well, with CSS, we can just cheat a little bit. So what difference does is it looks at all the pixel values. It looks at the difference between all the, the colors, RGB and A, um, from the active layer and background layer, and takes the absolute value. So with difference, similar pixels will turn black. Um, with exclusion, they'll turn that 50% gray. And this is really used for lining up transparencies in the past, making sure they were perfectly aligned. And I'll show you why. If I hover over this, you can see, oh, we're cheating. Those are all the answers, all the differences. So Sarah Drasner came up with this idea of visual regression testing with the difference blend mode, because you can just look at your before, look at your after, apply one line of code, and see what the differences are. Pretty cool. Took that idea and sort of expanded on it and created this site called Diffy.me, which allows you to do visual regression testing in your browser with CSS, with just one line of CSS code. 
Uh, it works locally because just behind your firewall, if you want to compare a staging site to anything you have local or an active site, and see what visual regression you've introduced into that site. CSS, pretty cool. So in review, CSS is awesome. We all knew that. Uh, when it works. <laughs> That's the caveat. So don't do these things because you know, browser support's not fully there yet. If you really need to support older browsers, not highly recommend this. Um, if you do need to support older browsers and you want to try the blend modes, consider the ordering of your divs and your images because it's still really possible to apply this and progressively enhance your website to use these effects. Um, performance, it is still faster to use a pre-edited image that you're sending to your page rather than um, edit them on the page itself because you have to paint that image and then apply the filter, so you have to repaint it, repaint the pixels on top of that. Your browser is doing calculation. So there is a little bit of a performance hit to this. You also can't save the images, which could be a good thing depending on if you want your users to grab your images. But if somebody right clicks and saves it, they're going to get the unfiltered, unedited version of that uh, rather than the nice filter that you applied on the page. Unless they take a screenshot, of course. And there's no thumbnail support. So what I mean by this is if you share it on Twitter or Facebook, people can see your content, but they're not going to see the filter that you applied to it because it's not native to the page. So consider that as well. Um, but do try this because performance. I know I just said this in the don't try this category, but um, we did show how it is good for performance in terms of that video if you wanted to make something really dynamic. There are certain cases where this is a lot better in performance. That one was a big one. Um, also, you don't have to send multiple image requests, so that could be a place where if you look at um, sort of what you gain and what you lose from doing these filters, you probably will gain a lot more if you're sending two images to your user for your hover effects or focus effects. Flexibility. Hovering, interacting, um, this provides for a lot of interaction on the web natively. You don't have to use JavaScript for this. It's really cool. Um, consistency. So embracing that cascade, allowing for all those styles to be generated from one bit of code, keeping your code really dry. Speed of prototyping. Because we can do this directly in our browser, we don't have to worry about um, doing it in Photoshop, sending it to the developer, having them apply it. You can just work with designers seated next to each other, doing pair design, pair programming, and sort of figure out what you want on the spot, which is great for those last minute changes, which always happen, always happen. Um, but it's nice. You can see it directly in the medium which you're presenting. Accessibility for those artistic designs, not just accessibility with text and screen readers, but allowing that to be searchable by web search engines, um, making your site a lot more semantic. And exploration. This is a big thing. Um, the ability to sort of explore what's coming up in CSS and seeing what we can do to push that further. Because the only way to push the web forward is to build something that pushes the web. And using things that push the web is how we can do that. So this is sort of like an awesome website. Uh, it's called Evolution of the Web. And here we can see sort of where technologies have come in and go. Um, and right there is CSS animation. I know it's kind of hard to see, which is pretty new. Um, Flexbox is also really, really new in comparison to all this. But filters are like baby. They're like toddler stage. You know, they're, they're brand new. So browsers are still really, really working on implementing these, making them really performant in the browser. Um, and so now is the time to sort of explore and see what we can do with them and help the browsers open bugs. Um, there's a big queue that you can really participate with, like Mozilla, um, tweet at browsers. They often will like reply and say, OK, we're working on this, or triage it that way. There was like a little uh, trend lately that was like hashtag edge bugs that you could tweet at them. It's pretty, pretty cool. So be an explorer and art the web. Try these things out. Thank you.